<laughs> hey, everybody. Hey, welcome to the interval tonight. You guys excited to be here? Everyone's so excited about capitalism, isn't it? It's great. So great. Um, well, thank you. We're, we're so excited you can be here tonight with us. It's our second talk of the year. Um, we are really excited about 2016 for a lot of reasons. One of them is that we've expanded our audience for these talks. Uh, we actually now have an online audience. Um, for those of you who are members, you may know that we have online uh, streaming for, uh, for to listen to seminars. We've had that for many years. Uh, but we've only just recently started it here at the Interval. So uh, hello to everybody at home. They're being uh, wired in upstairs. They're getting your slides in real time so they can see what's going on. And hopefully, we'll get to hear from some of them in the Q&A as well. Um, tonight's talk is the first of the year uh, that we're doing with CASBIS, the Center for the Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Um, if you came to last year's talk by Fox Harrell or uh, Marianne Wolf, then um, you, you know about CASBIS. Uh, they're a great program that's been around since 1954 in the social sciences um, that brings fellows from all over the world. And happily, uh, we're able to borrow uh, them and bring them uh, you know, an, an hour up, uh, up north to speak here in the interval uh, while they're here. So uh, Lewis is the first of several we're going to have this year, and uh, we want to Give a quick shout out to, to CASBIS as well. There's some brochures about their programs there. They have their own speaking series in Palo Alto uh, that we recommend you check out as well. Without any further ado, uh, please give a big round of applause. Lewis Hyman uh, from Cornell via CASBIS uh, here to speak tonight about the New Deal you don't know. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out to hear this little bit about history and to put things in context. Now, normally when I talk about the New Deal, I like to just talk about the 1930s. I like to talk about uh, maybe just 1934. That's my, my favorite year of the 1930s. Um, but since this is the Long Now Foundation, I was told that one year wouldn't be long enough, that 10 years wouldn't be long enough, that 10,000 years was the proper distance of time. But as an overachiever, I thought this was just short-term thinking. <laughs> I was like, you people are on the wrong time scale. You need to think about not 10,000 years, but the entire history of humanity going back a couple hundred thousand years. And if you consider that, this idea of a couple hundred thousand years, it begins to put in context how profoundly unnatural capitalism is. Capitalism, which has existed just for about 500 years since the dawn of the early modern, is but a blink in the eye of all human life. We take it to be very natural. This is something historians like to bandy about this term, naturalize, denaturalize. But all it means is, what is natural, what is unnatural? What's at stake in the political idea of something being natural? It's something that we can't change. It's something like gravity. It's something like beauty. I don't want beauty is probably historical too. I'm a historian, not an art historian. Yeah, but, but it's these things that we have no control over. So what I'm talking about tonight, when I'm talking about capitalism, I'm talking about something that humans have decided on to do and that a particular moment in time, we did had a tremendous amount of effect on how it was operating. Malthus. If any of you have looked into the history of economics, I was told not to pass here, or this guy would strike me down. So, <laughs> um, Thomas Malthus, a famous 18th century economist, famously wrote that most of human history there was no growth. In fact, there could not be any growth, because as soon as you started to make more food, what would happen? Your children would survive. You'd have more sex, have more children, as we all do when we eat too much. Um, <laughs> it was the 18th century. Things change. And uh, then suddenly, you gobble up all the excess food. So that's what this graph is, this graph of world GDP per capita. This is what the graph is over here. It's not world GDP, which is a measure of all the economic activity, but the world GDP 
per person. Now, I know if you're anything like my history students at Cornell, you hate math. But a little math goes a long way. So I don't, how many of you are frightened of math? Well, San Francisco is a different crowd. <laughs> Y'all are like, pro, OK, math, it's, math, it's on. All right. So if you look at this graph, I want you to look at the year 0 or 1 or whatever, 467. Now, $467 per person on the whole planet now. Do you think that's totally accurate? No, probably not. But it gives you a rough, whoa. Don't be touching my beer. All right. All right. OK. This is a rough sense. Go to 1,000 AD, 450. Roughly flat. If you extend this graph back thousands and thousands of years, roughly, it would have stayed flat. That's basically the amount of human activity per person since the dawn of agriculture. And then something changes. Something changes to make Malthus incorrect. And like most historians, he imagines the future through the past. And so Malthus is looking back. And if that had been the case, if nothing had changed, Malthus would have been correct. Before capitalism, the 99.7% of all human history, there was very little investment. There was very little technological change. The world of 1450 looked more or less like the world of zero. These printers and glass blowers looked like technologies that would have been legible to the ancient Romans. And in fact, the largest enterprises in Europe in this period had 40 people. That's the scale of human endeavor in the moment before capitalism really emerges. And then suddenly, things change. Things change. And you get to this graph, this very smooth looking graph. Now, I noticed some of you were nodding your head. What do you notice, class, about the math of this graph? I want you to notice the very smooth, flat plane until roughly the end. Now, it looks very flat because the end, the period post-1800, is so vertical. It's very easy to draw this graph. Even a robot can do it. <laughs> and it would be easy to forget that behind this graph are people and events and choices that made this growth possible. That, in fact, this kind of growth wasn't possible at any other period in hundreds of thousands of years that humans have existed. It's at this point that you're wondering who I am and why I'm talking to you. <laughs> and I was told that I had to give you some authority for who I am and why I'm talking to you. So briefly, I'm going to tell you a bit, a bit about me. I'm a historian of capitalism. <laughs> I have written books, several books, two on the history of debt in America, on the political economy and culture, as well as a reader. Um, uh, I went to college and then graduate school at these places. Then I worked at these two places, uh, McKinsey and Cornell, and now I am at this place, and now I'm done with that. I don't care about that. <laughs> what I care about is something very special. How many of you are drinking tonight? All right. yeah, drink with me, y'all. All right. Consider the interval. Now, everything you need to know about capitalism can be understood through that quintessential drink, beer. All right? Beer. Beer is the foundation of all our thought tonight. Are you guys comfortable drinking? Yes. Will you drink with me? All right, drink with me. All right. I want you to imagine a magical machine called the beer machine. It takes water and turns it into magical, delicious beer. All right? Not wine. That's for another person. But a magical machine. Now, what would you do with such a machine? If you had such a machine, I want you all to think to yourselves, about what you would do if I gave you a machine that nobody else had that would turn water into beer. <laughs> Who said that? Who said they would party? <laughs> yes, yes. You, sir, are a human being. <laughs> All of you that thought I would, I would, I would make a market at whatever you people do in, the, in Silicon Valley, that is not human, OK? <laughs> what humans would do if they had a beer machine is they would share. Because what happens if you share beer with that guy? He becomes, he becomes your friend, right? And then what happens? 
You can beat up nerds. That's right. So for most of human history, if you have beer or any other kind of luxury good, you share it with people and become popular and then make war. <laughs> this is a very natural kind of situation. You see it all the time at Cornell University. We call it a keg party. Okay. This is not what capitalism is. In capitalism, it is an idea that instead of sharing, you take that excess and you reinvest it. Instead of giving away beer to your friends and then making war upon your enemies, you sell the beer to your friends. And this is very strange. For the very first time, this is a schematic argument. I was given 35 minutes, all right? But the, uh, so I want you to realize that humans have always traded. There have always been exchanges between people. But only recently, in the last few hundred years, have people produced with machines like the beer machine in order simply to sell it and to exchange it. This is a new, novel way of thinking. Thinking, I have an excess. I will sell it, reinvest it, get more machines. This is a very weird idea. I mean, it's through this very weird idea that we come to the most important thing about capitalism, which is capital, um, this duality of capitalism, that money, capital is money, and, cap and capital is also an investment, something that is invested in like a beer machine. Now, if this were undergraduates, I'd ask you, how, what happens in your macroeconomics class? And you'd say, oh, it's very simple, Professor Hyman, because that's my name. The, you'd say, that's very simple. Savings equals investment. If there is an excess of money, it simply gets invested in the world. And this is how capitalism works. That's how capitalism is supposed to work. But if we are, as all people of the world, we know how hard it is to find a good investment. But we do know that what a capitalist would look like. Somebody who would take that excess and invest it. This person I'm about to show you is the worst example of a capitalist in American culture. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck is not a capitalist. Why is Scrooge McDuck not a capitalist? He is skiing on his money. <laughs> that is not a very capitalist thing to do. Do not acquire a hoard of gold and then ski upon it. <laughs> he is happy, it's true. A better capitalist is perhaps Andrew Carnegie, who wrote that the great manufacturing or commercial concern, which does not earn at least interest upon its capital, soon becomes bankrupt. It must either go forward or fall behind. To stand still is impossible. The economist's equilibrium, the place of stasis where savings equals investment, where everything is solid, does not exist in capitalism. In some very basic sense, that idea of market equilibrium is antithetical to what capitalism is. That idea of growth, the idea of what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. The idea that profits inevitably fall in mature industries and new industries rise up through the hands of entrepreneurs to create new sites of investment, overcoming this crisis. <laughs> Nerds. This is the great fear of Ogre in Revenge of the Nerds, right? That these nerds would come and they'd sell things and there'd be no more physical power. Ogre was right to fear them. <laughs> Capitalism offers growth, but it also offers us inequality. Using money to make more money, it doesn't care whether it's making beer machines or steel or consumer debt. It's agnostic to the source of profit. Where does this come from, this idea of capitalism? Now, it originates in roughly the 16th century in two great transformations. The discovery, well, first beginning with the discovery of the New World, the beginning of the African slave trade, which is the European slave trade of Africans, and the beginning of new kinds of factories that are organized in England and then in the US. These new kinds of systems had no new technology. They were just the reorganization of people. It's what historians now call the industrious revolution rather than the industrial 
revolution. This first stage of capitalism had no new technology. Everything you see here in the early manufactories, they had before, but they just did it at home. It's the reorganization of people, just like today with the gig economy. Now I'm talking in your language. Um, <laughs> it's the reorganization of labor online. No real transformation in what's happening in its underlying technology. So this is the early phase of capitalism. This is when the graph begins to basically creep up. European slavery. But then there's a breakout, and it's here, roughly around 1800. It's this moment when people begin to realize that it's not enough to reorganize people and to invest in production by organizing those people, but to invest in new technologies to increase productivity, to increase products that can then be sold. And it's this moment that we think of as the beginning of industrial capitalism, this moment when science, for the very first time, is harnessed for greater production and greater value. And this is when capitalism really, really takes off. I want you to keep noticing the scale on the left side over there, because you're not afraid of math. <laughs> and for the very first time in all of human history, economic growth per capita, economic growth is faster than people growth. We do not have sex and have children to eat away all our growth. And it's an amazing, amazing transformation. What historians, and econ particularly economic historians, talk about is this idea of the leading sector. How do you think about this transformation? How is it not just that smooth, inevitable-looking curve? And what the idea they use is this idea of the leading sector, that there's one particular area of the economy that is so profitable, that it pulls, and so big, that it pulls everybody else in its wake, bringing about new opportunities for growth, new jobs, wage growth, everything. And first, in the pre-industrial capitalism of the 18th century, you have cotton, sugar, and shipping, then industrial capitalism, wheat, railroad, steel, and then in the 20th century, cars and chemistry, aerospace and electronics. This shouldn't be that hard. This isn't a crazy idea. This is what we see every day. I mean, after all, how many of you have blackberries? <laughs> so retro. Did you come here in a fixie? I bet you did, yeah. So the idea, <laughs> so I think that this is a basic idea, that when a product comes out, there's tremendous opportunities for profits. It grows over time, and then as it becomes a mature industry, it falls. And this isn't true just of particular products like blackberries, but entire industries. So that over time, the technology becomes well-known, and it becomes a commodity industry. This is just normal ways of thinking. Now, this leading sectors are very important. Because, first of all, I think it should be obvious that aerospace is not obvious. That most of us cannot just walk outside and be like, oh, let's build a plane. Cool. Um, it's actually super hard. It's very hard to build a railroad. It's very hard to imagine an industry as complicated as the electronics industry. And so this transformation is not obvious what that next leading sector will be. And yet, so far, we have been able to figure out what it is, finding that new industry that allows us to bootstrap ourselves into the next level of growth. But finding that next sector has not been obvious in the past, as it was not in the 1930s, as it was not in the Great Depression. When there is a failure to find that new leading sector, when capital does not find its way into a sector that can pull along millions and millions and billions and billions of people, we have a depression. When capital can't find that place to earn that profit, we have a depression. And that's what happened in the 1930s. If you look closely at the industries of the 1930s, after the initial crisis, the crash of the stock market in 29, followed by a crash in the housing market a couple years later, all the cutting edge industries, like electronics and aerospace, they were fine within six months. But they were this big. They were this big. More people in the US worked in candy manufacturing 
than in airplanes in the 1930s. And all the big places where we invested all our capital, all our biggest employers, sorry, all our biggest employers, like cars, just wasted away. The stagnation was a crisis of the failure of capital to get into these new industries. Where is capital in America? In the 1930s, it was in banks. And capitalists like Amadeo Giannini, the founder of Bank of America, I want you to notice that he is not skiing. <laughs> he is not smiling. He is very, he's a very nervous Italian guy. He does not know what to do with all his money. This is a letter. More than any graph, I think, reveals this anxiety. This is a letter from the Citibank archives between the head of Citibank, then known as National Citibank, and the Bank of America. My dear AP, I want to give you a short report of conditions here and put before you the city company situation. Our excess reserves are very big. It's almost impossible to find any use for money in credits that we're willing to take, and the rates are terribly low. Too much capital, nowhere to put it, even though millions are out of work. And these new industries that we now know are great investments, or that are capable of producing millions of jobs, don't have capital to grow. I want you to think about that. Now, where does the New Deal fit into all of this? We all know that the New Deal is a bunch of liberals wasting money. <laughs> right? It's liberals, it's digging holes and filling them back up and paying people. And we're told this by the face of these two men, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Harold Ickes, bureaucrat. Now, when we think about the New Deal, we don't usually think about innovative investment. We do not think about entrepreneurship. And it's because of this guy on the left. I mean, what did he do? He ran the Public Works Administration, various government agencies that took tax, hard-earned taxpayer dollars and just built things. They built, uh, what did they build? They built stadiums, right? You can see a picture. They built bridges, parks and fairgrounds, school lunches. I mean, I guess we should have school lunches. But this is, these are things that we, and we're like, that's good. It's important to have school lunches. It's important to have stadiums, and we feel good about it. It's important to save America. Look, they build dams to power America. They, they, they build, um, this is Libby, Montana. Is anybody from Libby, Montana? No? <laughs> well, they, they gave a great city hall to Libby, Montana. All right? Look, they kept, they kept all our young men beautiful and shaved. <laughs> all right? And that's for people who are into beautiful young men. Look at that. I can send you the picture afterwards, send me an email. All right, keeping our young men manly, not idle. Look at him there. We have left it to private enterprise. We've seen the results. Capitalism failed. Capitalism bad. And every time Ickes wrote a check for a new stadium, across the New York Times would splash the headline, Ickes urges billions for a larger PWA plan. This is one vision of the response to the Depression. Spend more. Create jobs. Capitalism cannot work. We have total market failure. Capitalism was in free fall. But capitalism is not just spending. Capitalism is investment. Not useless investment, but investment in things that produce new industries, that produce growth. And his solutions, the solutions you were all told about in your high school history classes, did not reignite investment. Luckily, there were other people in the New Deal that you've not heard about, probably. Or if you have, you haven't been told what they really did. The crisis of the New Deal was this crisis of investment, how to get all this private capital that AP Giannini was fretting about through the tube where Uncle Sam was sitting on this hose and spraying it on the garden of recovery. Now, there's two things I want you to notice. That Uncle Sam has a hose connected to the capital, and that the hose has all kinds of knots in it, and he's standing on it. 
What they figured out was how to get that capital onto the garden. And the man that did it was this guy, hanging pretty, Jesse Jones, on the shoulders of Harold Eckes. Look at that. Harold, Harold, I feel bad for Harold. He did not seem like a lot of fun. Jesse Jones, he's a fun guy. He was pure Texas, all right? Yeah. They called him Uncle Jesse. He was six foot three, and he was a multimillionaire. In a time when there weren't many multimillionaires, he was a risk taker. He owned his own newspaper. He, owned, he was the, one of the largest real estate developers in America. He had his own bank. He was the original investor in what became Exxon. This was not, he, re, he built Houston from a, a land scam into a port city. <laughs> Needless to say, Jesse Jones believed in the power of entrepreneurialism and the power of investment. And it was Jesse Jones who thought that Eastern bankers were too conservative. He didn't identify with these Eastern banking values, these anxieties of whether or not to take risk with capital. Years later in his autobiography, he recounted the fear as, quote, the bankers began to hoard. They called in loans. They declined to make loans. And in the spreading fright, the aim was simply to convert everything possible into cash and let the business of extending credit, the lifeblood of commerce and industry, take shelter until the dark skies had cleared. He recognized that one of the signal failures of the economy was the fear and the way in which capital was being hoarded. Jones was a banker. And when he came to Washington, as he did initially under Hoover and then had his position expanded under FDR, he came as a banker in something that was behind many of the successful other parts of the New Deal, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Don't worry, there will be no exam. <laughs> now, three of the things I want to talk about very, very briefly, I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A. The first thing is the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, that I'm certain you've all heard of. It was a, a program that did work just like, well, connecting those private banks and consumers. What it did was it acted as a middleman, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, borrowing money either directly from these banks and then lending it to consumers, or creating a market intermediary. In the FHA case, that was Fannie Mae, which worked until very recently. OK. But it worked to allow people in New York City to invest in Texas to invest in California, and allowed consumers to borrow money at scale for the very first time. The REA, which I bet some of you history buffs might remember from high school as well, the Rural Electrification Administration. When in, the early, in 1930, 90% of rural America had no electricity whatsoever. You could tell you were going from country, from city to country, by the darkness that would fall around you. And this had widespread effects. You couldn't electrify your farms. You couldn't, farmers couldn't buy things they needed of the modern economy. And so what the REA did was instead of giving money to consumers, it set up electrical cooperatives throughout the country, channeling money again through intermediary loan systems from the private capital of Eastern banks and Western banks into rural America, setting off an incredible agricultural productivity boom. And the third part, which I will buy you a beer if you know about, unless you are a professional historian, Liz, <laughs> the Defense Plant Corporation, which did the same thing in the, name of, in the name of defense, but for aerospace and electronics. And I want to talk about this one as the most technologically sophisticated of all these areas. And so these policies in the 1930s solved the Depression not through government spending, but through Uncle Sam's ability to steer the hose of capital. The totality of all those stadiums and free lunches and well-shaved young men added together accounted for about one or two months of spending. All that over many years through these programs. Billions of dollars that were private dollars that taxpayers didn't pay for that were simply 
the movement of capital into riskier areas that capitalists themselves were afraid of, that they themselves made profit on, was done through this. And so it's through this public policy that a private good is created. And we created all kinds of new industries that became the foundation of our post-war prosperity. I want to talk about aerospace for a few minutes. Again, more people in 1939 were working in candy than were working in aerospace. It was the 41st largest industry in America. The entire industry in 1939 made 3,000 planes. It's hard to get our heads around the state of the airplane industry in the 1930s. We're told by, in our books you know, that at Kitty Hawk, 30 years earlier, they had made planes, and they had. But it was still kind of a weird thing. It's kind of like the space plane today. How many of you have ridden in space? Because maybe you have. This is Silicon Valley. <laughs> right, but this is not a normal situation, right? <clears throat> I mean, the flight from New York to Paris that Lindbergh did, he was a hero in 1927. You know, he got a prize for that, which was then the inspiration, of course, for the Ansari X Prize in 2004, which gave us the first space plane. Now, I've never ridden a space plane. This is the same kind of situation between the 20s and 30s as the aughts to now. Only I do not expect to be in a space plane in the next two years. I do not expect America to start producing hundreds of thousands of space planes to fight space Nazis. <laughs> now, while Lindbergh was celebrated as a hero, I think the real hero were people who created this whole new industry, not only to fight Nazis, which we know from the internet is evil, but because they created a thing that employed millions of Americans. They created amazing new technologies and revolutionized capitalism. Now, the DPC were not a bunch of Harold Ickes. They were not a bunch of bureaucrats. They were people of the world. This is the worst slide in my presentation. It was too complicated. I refused to redo the boxes. But I want you to notice the people involved, the chairman of US Steel, the president of General Motors, who, by the way, was one of the main inventors of the assembly line, Ralph Budd of the railroad, but also Sidney Hillman, prominent labor leader, Harriet Elliott, the dean of the University of North Carolina. These were people who stepped out of their social milieus, stepped out of their politics, extreme left, extreme right, came together and figured out public policy that would connect that private capital with the public interest. This isn't creating a worker's utopia. This is creating the closest we've ever come in American history, the post-war prosperity. What did they do? In just a few years, they created an industry that, had an, that was four times the size of the pre-war auto industry. So it went from something where more candy was being made to something larger than the largest industry in America in just a few years. Consider the amount of imagination that took, organizing the people behind it, connecting the dots, and yet they did it. They built 1,000 airfields. Imagine the scale of doing that. There were 28 before the war. 1,000 airfields, and then they turned them over to, private, to the private sector so that there could be a post-war aerospace industry. Detroit supplied the engines, but they built these new plants everywhere, Tulsa, Los Angeles. And this was something that I think I'm just so inspired by, that 40% of Los Angeles was working for the aerospace industry by the end of the war. 2.1 million people, all done without government money. Curtis Wright becomes second only to General Motors in corporate size in just a few years. I just want you to think about the scale of this transformation. Millions and millions and millions of people, billions of dollars. It's a wild reorientation of the economy. This is um, a list of the different companies that were involved. Alcoa, General Motors, US Steel. This isn't a bunch of startups. This is big corporate capitalism. This is the amount of money on the right um, that they invested in these different areas. 
Um, $3 billion in 1945. Now, you're probably wondering, what is that today? Oh, I wish I had a slide that said that. Boom. All right. <laughs> um, this is how much money that would be today. $42 billion, $15 billion into steel, $14 billion into synthetic rubber. Yes, there was no synth synthetic rubber industry before the DPC. This created that. Can we do that in America today? Can we imagine ourselves into a new economy, new industries? Can we employ millions of people? Can we build the space planes of tomorrow? Can we find the money? Where would all this money come from? There isn't enough money, we're always told. What would be something like this today? Ickes, of course, was furious. They were abandoning New Deal ground. This was just giving money to capitalists and to corporations. And he was right, but with a particular purpose. Created jobs, created guns, fight Nazis, and those profits were limited by windfall tax laws. And so channeling this private capital rebuilt the economy. And for me, at least, I think this is an excellent model for thinking about how to promote innovation, entrepreneurship, and technological change in our economy today. It's not one silver bullet, it's three different silver bullets for organizing local banks, for organizing local cooperatives, for organizing monopolies. And today, I think we need it. I think we need it. Does it feel like a return to prosperity? These two happy gentlemen will tell you different. And we can see it in our politics, that we're told, oh, no, no, the unemployment rate, it's only 5%. Why are you so unhappy, world? America, you have jobs now. The recovery is over. Yet this number conceals a lot. This number conceals a lot. And again, you told me you were comfortable with math. So I want you to look at this scale, 2005 to 2015. At the beginning, unemployment's around 5%. At the end, it's 5%. Shut up, go get a job. But there's a story behind that about labor force participation. Unemployment is the number of people looking for work in the last two weeks that have not been able to find it. This story is people who are in the workforce. And that's a very different story. That's a number going from about 66% to about 63% of people who have just given up since the Great Recession. This is actually pretty stunning. If you go a little further back to 1990, you can see it going up and down, cycles of the economy. And then you see the precipitous collapse after the Great Recession. And if you begin to add these together by squiggling number, by scratching on slides, all right, that's the difference there. We can all keep that in our heads. That's when you add the squiggle on top. <laughs> okay, I did it, I put it together. All right, but basically, 3.5% of the workforce has dropped out since the Great Recession. Add that to the unemployment, and we have not had a job recovery. 8% of people are without work. We're being told everything's great, and it's not. Our biggest firms, our most exciting areas, our most exciting companies, like these, Google and Goldman Sachs. And like, I love, I love Google. I love Google. Um, <laughs> I love Google. Um, but nobody works there, right? My sister does. But otherwise, nobody really works there. More people work at Sears. 10 times as many people work at Sears as work at Google. I think in San Francisco, it's hard to keep that in our heads. The difference between who we're excited about, all who we know who work in tech, and the scale of it actually impacting the economy, and the difference is pretty intense. The biggest firms we have employ hardly anyone and do nothing to soak up all that capital. I'm sure all of you have heard about how easy it is to have a startup these days in terms of being capital light investment. This is that world. So what would that big question mark be today? Now, I am a historian. I am not an industrialist. If I were an industrialist, I wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> but there's two things we know we want that to look like. We know that we want to have capital flowing into small and medium-sized businesses. Nowadays, it's nearly impossible for a small business that's not a startup, that's just a 
plumbing supply company that's been profitable or a cheese shop that wants to grow but can't get investment. It's impossible for banks to them to get commercial loans. I'll show you in a second why that is. At the same time, it's very hard to get our biggest corporations to really take risks, to focus on inventing new leading sectors, like Alcoa did, like Curtis Wright did in the post-war period. But is there money? Is there money to do this? Do we have capital somewhere? The answer is, yes, we do. We have a lot of money. Current government regulations require about $98 billion to be on the books of our banks. We have a little more than that. We have $2.4 trillion in excess of our reserves. I think that's a lot of money. You could do a lot of work with that money if that money got invested into businesses. What does that mean in terms of scale? It's about two-thirds of the entire federal budget. That is a lot of money just sitting there, just like it did in the Great Depression. But where do banks have their money? Maybe their money's already tied up in risky business ventures. They don't want any more. Is that the case? No, that's also not the case. This is a graph of business loans and consumer loans. I checked this 16 different ways. I couldn't believe it when I saw this that right now, consumer debt is around three and a half, um, three and a half trillion. And this is, this is business loans. This is like negligible. It's like a few hundred billion dollars. 97% less. I don't know about you, but this is not how capitalism is supposed to work. Those are supposed to be flip-flopped. That's how economies grow. They don't grow through consumer debt. But if you're curious about how this happened, there's a book that I wrote <laughs> called Borrow that I can tell you about how that happened. But basically, the idea is that it became much easier to securitize all this consumer debt, to bundle it up and sell it on capital markets than it is for business debt. In fact, it's not possible really to do that now. And in fact, um, our largest government agency that's supposed to be in charge of doing this, doing what we imagined, what, what the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did in the 1930s, uh, the, the Small Business Administration, does hardly any of it. So $15 billion. This is, this is like a drop in the bucket compared to either the size of banks or even the entire market for small business loans if you include real estate. Why is this? It's because we had government policies in the 1960s and 70s that made it possible to securitize consumer debt, to make it easier for banks and lenders and investors to put money into your credit cards than into your small business, than into even your large business. And this is from a report from the uh, Federal Reserve, a report to Congress, why it's not possible to do this. Now, I think if it's possible to hide Greek debt by Goldman Sachs, if it's possible for all those wizards of Wall Street to do all the magic they do every day, we can probably do for small business debt what we did for houses in Texas in the 1930s, before they had computers or, you know, anything, really. They were just primitive <laughs> they're cavemen that's in Texas. That's point one. Point two it would not fix the new leading sector. How do we find this new leading sector? For instance, we're all excited about self-driving cars. Who's excited about self-driving cars? I'm excited about self-driving cars. I hate driving. I like sleeping and reading. Now, this will create a lot of demand. I'm very excited. This is a good thing. It'll create a lot of demand, though, not just for the cars, the replacement of all our cars, but also the rebuilding of our cities, the rebuilding of our entire built environment around these cars, a lot of connections a lot of growth. This is the kind of thing that could be part of a new leading sector. It is the right direction. Now, the other thing I want to talk about with that is that sounded crazy how many years ago? Two? Three years ago? If I was here five years ago and I was like, hey, I'm going to get a self-driving car, you're like, yeah, good luck with your rocket boots. <laughs> and yet it's possible. It's a failure of imagination. 
In fact, we see this all the time in our society, a failure of imagination, which stems from a basic failure of science, which I'm going to come back to. We live in an era that is not disruptive, but incrementalist. Bear with me. Most of the science we build our technology on, the basic scientific principles, electricity, quantum mechanics, have resulted in products that have been refined since the 1960s, since the 1950s even, in a lot of ways. Incrementalist. It's no been, it's been no, this room basically would look the same 50 years ago, whereas 50 years before that, none of it would exist. We think we live in a time of technological change, but it's actually relatively slow because we have cut off imagination and we've cut off innovative science. Now, a good test of what a new leading sector would be, does it sound as crazy as a self-driving car? What are some of the kinds of crazy things you could imagine in the future? I named rocket boots. <laughs> Those sound totally insane. I want to put out one thing that also sounded, the 10 years ago, when I was talking about this with my wife and we were in grad school, I was like, self-driving cars and space elevators. Space elevators, right? Those sound crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, a big strip of material into space with an elevator attached? That's ludicrous. But imagine what it would be like. It's the right order of thinking. Something totally, totally new a platform for other industries, radical new material science, and most importantly, millions and millions of jobs as a platform for new possibilities. And again, I am not an industrialist. I am not a scientist even, so I have no stake in this. If this happens, I will not make any money. <laughs> I will not even be allowed in space because my wife thinks I'm going to die there. Okay. <laughs> now, this is the right order of thinking, okay? And it's not a coincidence that the companies that create the greatest innovation right now that are starting, in my, my experience, my feeling, we actually restart this process are the ones that are monopolies. Just like in the post-war with Bell Labs. This idea of competitive capitalism actually chokes out the possibility for real innovation. And that's one part of it, but it's also the problem of science funding. We hear a lot about the 99% and the 1%. Well, this is the 1% we don't talk about which is the less than 1% of the federal budget that goes into science research in America. None of which goes to historians. I have no skin in the game here. <laughs> but $31 billion to the NIH, $8 billion to the NSF, supporting the entire scientific enterprise of our nation, supporting all the possibility for new science that allows for new sites of investment to allow capitalism to continue to grow to create prosperity. We need new science to create new capitalism. We need new scientists to create new science. But right now, because it's impossible to get grants, every young scientist you know is going to work on Wall Street. All the young scientists are going to work in consulting. When I started to work at McKinsey, I, went, I was talking to a guy, and I'm like, what did you do before you came here? And I was like, what do you do here? He's like, I do. He's like, oh, I invented a fifth state of matter. <laughs> I was the MIT team that uh, extracted the Bose-Einstein condensate. That sounds awesome, right? I was like, that's <laughs> awesome. I'm like, you're awesome. I just write down things that happened before. <laughs> and he was like, and I'm like, what do you do now, man? And he's like, oh, I do business to business pricing. And I was like, something has gone horribly wrong. <laughs> Replicate this a thousand times over. No one becomes a scientist because they want to make money, all right? Maybe a couple of people do, but mostly they want to be scientists. This is a real problem for everybody. So what should we do? We need to get our scientists back in labs, not on Wall Street. We need to move away from short-term profits to long-term investment. We need to move away from consumer debt to business lending. We need to do science again. We need to believe and imagine a capitalism that can include everyone. And so what the entrepreneurs of the New Deal recognized was that it wasn't a smooth curve. This curve was not inevitable. This curve was made by people, made by choices, made by imaginations. And so today, as we think about how to reframe the economy, we need to not worry about a little percentage in the unemployment there 
or a little percentage here, or that interest rate of this, because the economy is not made by economists. The economy is made by people who can imagine a different world, by the Jesse Joneses and all the people who worked in these post-war firms. The story of the New Deal that I told you tonight about how the New Deal reinvented capitalism has been written out. It's been written out of our histories because a statist liberal left does not want to talk about anything that impedes their spending. And on the right, the right has forgotten how important it is to have the state overcome risk, to act together with the state and invest in the future. And I think America has a great potential, and certainly capitalism is a great engine for growth. And we want it to work for us, not work us over. And so we need to make it work for the next 500 years, much less the next 10,000 years. And to do that, we need to recognize that it's an engine for growth, an engine for inequality, but also an engine that needs a little tune-up every now and again. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Appreciate being here. It's, uh, it's pretty good beer, right? It's super tasty. <laughs> the beer is not free here. I apologize for the unnatural state. Uh, um, Thank you, Lewis. That's, that's great. So um, we'll, we'll get a couple quick questions. Uh, we've got a little bit of time for questions. Um, first off, uh, I want to just take a moment to talk about what you're working on now, because you're, you're here, you're at Casbus right now, you're right. working on a new book. I'm writing a new book. It's called Temp, The Deep History of the Gig Economy. So I'm trying to write a history of how um, we all became flexible workers and how this world of stable work and stable investment uh, went away, and the winners and losers in that story, and what we can do to make that possible to keep this growth curve going. And, and I know you're here and based at, at Stanford, at CASBIS, so you're getting to talk to some amazing people. Do you want to just Yeah, if anybody little... here is in the HR department of a large tech corporation, I would like to talk with you or not. Um, but yeah, I'm talking to amazing people, and it's wonderful how open people are on the West Coast to really solving problems. And that's something I've noticed while being out here for the last you know, six months. So uh, what, uh, what questions? We've got a question in the audience right there. So, so just to repeat the question, make oh. sure the folks at home can hear it. So what was the mechanism that uh, the, the capital was moved? Um, yeah, there was legisla a combination of legislation and executive order, but basically empowering the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, to run experiments. And so actually one of the most amazing things about FDR was not that he, was very sm he wasn't very smart, right? I mean, he's generations of plutocrats breeding, right? <laughs> but he was a great experimenter. He allowed lots of different things to happen. Um, and it, that's really what was amazing about FDR, empowering people like Harold Ickes to do his thing, to build stadiums, right? And to keep young men employed, but also empowering um, people who believed in a different vision of how to repair the economy. Um, and if you want to, I can talk at length about the actual instruments, but basically it was a system by which banks and lenders would have their principal guaranteed by a collective pool of insurance so that if something defaulted, they would get back their original principal in a series of bonds rather than the immediate payment. So it made them have skin in the game, but it also allowed them to take risks in ways they wouldn't have done ordinarily by collective insurance. Uh, and, and I should mention, uh, on the topic of capitalism, do, do we still have any of Lewis's books uh, in the back? We've got, we got a few of your, we're, we have Lewis's books. Lewis is going to stick around, um, so you can buy his book if you'd like. We have a few copies. Books left. make great gifts. <laughs> also, they're great for starting fires. So whatever you want to do with the book is your business. So you can kind of go either way. Either way. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're like, you really need that satisfaction. Uh, so, other questions? Um, so we hope you'll stick around, and he'll be able to answer more questions afterwards. Why don't we, do you have any questions on the side of the room? I'll go down the stairs there at the bottom. So, so the question. <laughs> so, uh, we marry well. I. So, so the question from a creative is. Yeah. Why are all the dummies the ones that become billionaires, and, and are there any smart people that? Uh... Um. So I'm in academia. I know a lot of poor smart people. I don't know. I. I don't think that's the whole story. Um. I'm sure there's smart billionaires. I've never met a billionaire. Maybe you're a billionaire. Is there a billionaire in the crowd? No? OK. Um, but I think that feeling of frustration is what you're really speaking to, right? That it seems random. 
It seems like they're just taking advantage of an accident of history. I think there has been a lot of that feeling. And a question of, all right, what are they going to do with all this money? Are they just going to you know, do rails of coke? Or are they going to provide for society in some serious way, right? And it's not like Andrew Carnegie was really giving back when he invent, like, opened libraries, but his workers had to be at the factory when the library was open during the week, all right? So it's not like people in the past were like really wonderful who were super wealthy. But it's something that, um, you know, we should figure out how to create industries that create jobs, whereas these billionaires, these equity billionaires, really aren't creating lots and lots of jobs. And this is the problem, that the money is sloshing around looking for a place to go, and it's going into these things that create filters for your camera to take pictures of stuff. Um, this is not the same as a railroad. Um, and so, the so, so uh, a couple of questions. I know your focus is on US capitalism yes. primarily. I'm a navel gazer. That's so, what you call me in the field. But, so, but I'm curious, to the extent that you're tracking things in other countries, I mean, one, one question that comes to mind is we're talking about instant billionaires is like the Russian situation, or are there other places, is, would you say that what you described tonight, <laughs> um, what, what you've described tonight is typical of what's happening in other countries as well, or is, are, there, is there, are there countries where they're investing in technologies um, and industries in, in a way to have things go? Um, I think that there's been an export of the US model of austerity and a US vision of how corporations should be organized. The place that's not doing this, that's the most antithetical, is perhaps Germany, a place that really invests in its workforce, that um, has invests in the future, that creates policies that believe in long-term return rather than short-term profit. Um, but I think what's really going to happen to make that really change is people have to stand up as a collective whole, demand political action. Um, but also, honestly, billionaires that aren't stupid, there's a few. Um, that to stand up and say, look, I believe in a different kind of economy and I don't need the money anymore. And it's not just about charity going to Africa and then even though you know nothing about Africa, I'm not naming names. Um, uh, you know, so I think that this is the question, right? Like how do we empower that? So, so one of the things to sort of tie that together then is the, the private investment in space as an example, right? Yeah. So that's, does that take the place of the government? Could, you, could that come forward and lead could that become a leading industry I mean, fueled by private? I mean, I, I feel like right now it's great if it can happen private, um, but places where it's not happening, like the space elevator or, <laughs> I don't know, other stuff? I don't know. I'm a, I'm, I study the 1930s. I'm really excited about the latest Myrna Loy film. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and I don't know about other countries that, I mean, there's other people here. As an academic, I'm reticent to talk about other things I don't know about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, one, uh, one last question here on the second row. I want to uh, uh, keep talking about sort of the international scenes. The um, image of a Los Angeles that's 40% aerospace jobs working in these great <clears throat> tech factories is so compelling. Yeah. You fast forward 50 years or however many, and we really did invent a new sci-fi technology, right? We take it for granted now, but this is bonkers science fiction. Sure, and it, and it originally began in the 60s. New, let let the record new, state that the new sci-fi technology is a mobile phone. Is the mobile phone. Sure. It's a new leading sector, but the LA where 40% of the jobs are part of this of this amazing sector is in China. And so like, how, did, how do you solve that puzzle? Yeah. Uh, how do you, so when, when capital is international in that way, how does this stuff play out? Even if we do invent so, something tremendous. So, so when capitalism is international uh, that way, how does, how does it kind of get the traction to, to, to have the effects that you're, you're talking about? So, so how does this, what happens to cell phones in China? So the interesting thing about China is that even in China, most people are not working in manufacturing, even though those urbanites are coming in from rural districts, you know, where they don't really have like, all kinds of rights because of that, to work at Foxconn. Um, they don't have, um, even there, manufacturing is not driving things, really. It's a search for cheaper and cheaper labor. Um, so it's not the same thing as we have a new technology where we require lots of people because we haven't automated it yet. We haven't been able to figure out how to get a machine to do what a human can. And that's what really requires people. That's what creates all the jobs. Something that's so novel that you can't automate it yet. Um, and so cell phones are awesome. I love my cell phone. I wake up and I go to sleep with it <laughs> next to my face. I give it a sweet smooch smooch. But it is also the transistors in this. The science is not novel, except for maybe the screen. Not impressed by the cell phone. No, um, <laughs> Corning. Corning? No, the only part I'm impressed by is Corning, which makes the glass. Corning got hammered for the last 40 years in its stock price 
because it actually invested in research and development. It believed in science. And so a company like Corning is now paying off big time. Now, I'm impressed by cell phones. I'm just saying it's not like the invention of antibiotics. It's not the same as the invention of the car, right? So like, I'm just asking for a little you know, pushback on the cell phone being the best thing ever. All right, so, so uh, we're going to wrap it up. Last thing, though, um, you have uh, a talk coming up in April at CASBIS. That the, we've got pamphlets from CASBIS uh, at the back. Uh, you can grab one. Yes. Do you want to just say Oh, uh, it's what on the future about? of work in the Anthropocene, um, on the, how we envision uh, work changing in an era of ecological change with my colleague Natasha Iskander uh, there. So, um, yes, yeah, so if you want to come to that, please do. A totally different topic, totally Great. different talk. That's, that's free. It's down at CASBIS, and it's in April. Again, but no beer. In the back. BYO. Just whiskey. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more big round of applause. Thank for you. Lewis. <laughs>